Um, thank you, Eileen. Um, it's, it's really great um, to be back at the, the Lincoln Library um, again. As, as Eileen mentioned, um, I did some of the research, um, spent many happy days down the hall here in these rooms scrolling through um, newspaper uh, microfilm reels and, um, and um, letters uh, across the hall. And um, it's doing research at, um, at the Lincoln Library is a great thing, um, and it's a terrible thing in a way. Um, it's, it's a great thing because um, the people are, are absolutely amazing, as you know. People like Eileen, who's an, an expert in foreign policy in her own right. Um, people like um, Dr. James Cornelius, the, the curator of the Lincoln Collection, um, who's a, a, a living, breathing encyclopedia of all things Lincoln. Um, so those are the good things. Um, the, um, the terrible thing is when you're here doing research, you're surrounded by the 15,000 books about Abra Link, Abraham Lincoln that have already been written. Um, and so um, I think um, it's, a, it's a stark reminder that anybody who, who comes here and asks you to put another book on that shelf really has some explaining to do right at the beginning. And so that's what I wanted to, to start off um, by, by doing. Um, because um, I came to Lincoln in a kind of backwards way. Um, my book is about Lincoln's foreign policy, which is something that's been written about very infrequently. Um, and um, my background is in journalism, not in academia. I was working as a foreign correspondent um, for many years, uh, mostly in the Middle East, reporting on the ground in places like Syria and Libya and Yemen. Um, and so I was used to covering foreign affairs at the street level, but I went through a period um, several years back where um, I really wanted to take a step back and look at some of the frameworks of American foreign policy, um, some of the traditions of American foreign policy. Um, and so I, I started reading um, and um, uh, started studying this from the early days of the Republic through post-World War II empire building. And um, I, I discovered that diplomatic history is a surprisingly small um, academic field. I, I, I saw the, um, the former Pakistani ambassador, Hussein Haqqani, speak this past summer, and he said, um, um, you know, Americans are the only ones who, when they say that's history, they mean that's irrelevant. Um, and he, he, he had a point. Um, there's some truth to that. Um, but I guess that I felt like studying how Americans acted historically in international affairs would lead to a deeper understanding of the way we act now. And so I kind of stumbled across this period, um, but I was sucked in right away, first of all um, and foremost, because the characters are absolutely amazing. You've got, I mean, they're like something out of a novel. I write nonfiction, but um, you've got Cassius Marcellus Clay, Lincoln's minister to Russia, who walks around the streets of St. Petersburg with Bowie knives hangling, dangling from his waistband and picking fist fights. So um, this is the kind of guy we're dealing with there. John Hay, Lincoln's personal secretary, described Clay as 25 cents worth of yellow-covered romance. <laughs> You've got Charles Sumner, the powerful and pompous chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, one journalist said of Sumner that he works his adjectives so hard that if they ever got him alone, they'd murder him. You have Lord Palmerston, the British Prime Minister. Um, Victor Hugo once said that Palmerston belonged a little to history, but much more to fiction. You had Eugenie, the strong-willed, strongly anti-American French empress. And the, the story is told, I don't know if this is true or not, but it's uh, indicative of her character that she once stabbed herself in the arm with a dagger to prove how tough she was. And then, of course, you have Lincoln himself. And for all that's been written, there's been very little about Lincoln's foreign policy. Um, there hasn't been a holistic human account of Lincoln's role in foreign affairs in nearly 70 years. And um, that's before the Lincoln Papers were made public in 1947. So there's an awful lot of water under the bridge since then. And um, I, there are a few reasons for that, I think. First of all is the, the obvious reason we think of the Civil War as a domestic conflict. And, and it was. And so there was an awful lot going on at home. But another reason is that Lincoln had a very powerful and shrewd Secretary of State, as you know, and William Henry Seward. And so Lincoln delegated a lot of day-to-day -day diplomacy to Seward. So if you situate Lincoln right in the center of his own foreign policy, you end up with a hagiography because Lincoln didn't do every single thing. So part of my approach is in how you slice it. The great Lincoln biographer James Randall once said that if you compare Lincoln to Teddy Roosevelt or Woodrow Wilson or Theodore Roosevelt, he didn't do all that much in international affairs. But the things that he did do were very important. 
And so my approach was to be very selective and hone in on those things and look at five key episodes that I feel reveal what a Lincolnian foreign policy is all about. Now, one of the reasons that it's possible to do this is there's been a genuine and astonishing boom in Lincoln scholarship in recent years. And I don't just mean the quantity of stuff, because there's been a lot of stuff, um, too, but I'm talking about the quality of Lincoln books that are coming out right now. Um, and I want to explain how some of these scholars have done this, because I think it's fascinating. Um, because there have been so many biographies of Lincoln, some of the greatest historians that have written about him have become themselves figures of importance. And so they leave their research materials, essentially their, their note cards, to university libraries or the Library of Congress, where other scholars can kind of pay, you know, flip through their note cards. And um, you have to be careful using this stuff. You have to fact check it. But um, it's useful because um, historians can look for bits that have ended up on the cutting room floor and that are useful and include those in their own works. And the, the great one at this in recent years is Michael Burlingame. Um, if you haven't read his book, read it. It's the, the gold standard. This massive two-volume biography um, of Lincoln, and he's done just this. Um, this is his trademark techniques to go to these papers, dig out old newspaper clippings, um, note cards, this sort of thing, in addition to all the ordinary primary sources, newspapers, diaries, letters, and that sort of thing. And that method worked really well for me on a project like this, since I could go and look through the lens of foreign policy, because past scholars weren't always thinking about foreign policy. It wasn't an interest for them. And I could pull out some interesting material that um, had been overlooked. Um, I'll give you one example, uh, Mary Lincoln. Um, we, we have a certain image of her as um, a difficult person who had a difficult life. She had three of her children died in her lifetime and she saw her husband assassinated before her eyes. So it wasn't easy being Mary Lincoln, but in many ways she was more cosmopolitan than Lincoln. Um, she had grown up in Lexington, the Athens of the West, and went to a school where the students spoke French. And um, her family, the Todds, kind of lorded this over Lincoln, which um, he didn't appreciate. He liked to say, um, one D was good enough for God, but not for the Todds. <laughs> and when I dug into the research, I found that she played a role in diplomatic appointments. She tried to influence Lincoln's diplomacy. And when you go to the papers of past historians of Mary Lincoln, um, I found contemporary newspaper clippings that I hadn't seen anywhere else, that they hadn't used, that talked about her interference in diplomatic matters, trying to get her candidates um, appointed to various posts. Sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. And that was interesting to me and relevant and so I included it. Now one of the things that drew me to this period were some similarities between the mid-19th century and our own times. And I don't want to overdo this because in one sense there's no comparison. The U.S. was essentially an emerging market. It was the India or the China of its day during this period. Britain was the world's economic superpower. Um, but there were a number of other powerful players on the world stage at this time. France was still a major player um, even after the, the Napoleonic Wars. Russia was a rising power. Uh, Spain was quickly becoming less important but it was still a player. And so on the one hand, it's this age of nationalism. You have all these competing powers that pursued their national interests, and you end up with some great, powerful, self-interested statesmen. Otto von Bismarck took power in 1862, became prime minister, so the age of blood and iron is coming. In Britain, you had Palmerston, who's famous for saying Britain had no eternal friends, only national interests. In France, you had Napoleon III, and I read you Victor Hugo's description of Palmerston. I'll read you his fantastic description of Napoleon III. He says, um, Napoleon is a man of middle height, cold, pale, slow, who looks like he's not quite awake, esteemed by women who want to become prostitutes and by men who want to become prefects. So that's what we're dealing with in this era. That's the cast of characters. Now, many self-described realist foreign policy thinkers, people like Henry Kissinger, think we're headed in that direction again as the emerging markets rise and the U.S. has its own problems at home. Instead of acting like the world's sole superpower, the U.S. will pursue its selfish interests, competing on the world stage like any other nation, and in many ways we see that happening already. But the other interesting thing about the times is that it was also an information age. The world was shrinking. This was the period that saw the advent of the telegraph, the steamship, a huge boom in newspaper publishing. And so at the same time these national conflicts are taking place, other forces are bringing nations closer together, and that has obvious similarities to our own times. In the diplomatic world, it meant nothing was private anymore. The, um, the French Empress Eugenie complained, diplomacy has so few secrets nowadays. Those were her words 150 years ago. 